Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of MedChat Monday Healthcare Specialty Series. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. We have so many interesting speakers and doctors from across the country and from Canada who are going to inspire us about different specialties in medicine that we can pursue. Today, we are going to discuss cardiology. Okay, that's your heart. Okay, just in case you don't know that. Today, we have Dr. Colin Murphy who's actually up in Canada, uh, who's going to teach us what, it's, what it takes to become a cardiologist. So, Dr. Murphy, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Great to have uh, – I'm glad to be on board, uh, Dr. Kopelman. So, Dr. Murphy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that you were probably asked when you applied to medical school. Why did you decide to become a doctor? That is a great question, and if you can answer this question for your medical school interviews, you should completely ace them. Um, you know, for me, it was not a direct path. Um, I It took a while to figure out. I actually went into mechanical engineering, um, so I was in that program for four years at the University of Toronto in Canada, and I soon realized probably in my third year that I didn't want to be an engineer. I mean, not that I didn't have a passion for the subject material, but I just felt that I wanted to make a difference, and medicine just seemed to be a place to do that. So, um, you know, it was kind of a, a natural progression for me. Uh, I had an uncle who was a gastroenterologist, and for those of you who don't know, that's somebody who looks at the stomach, looks at the bowel, and he was a super kind of inspirational guy, so he got me thinking about medicine, and the other thing was, when I was in my third year of engineering, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Ross Seth here. He was in biomechanical engineering, and he was doing really cool research on looking at things like blood flow through blood vessels and studying them from an engineering perspective. Um, they had uh, these things called bypass graphs at the time that many of you have probably heard. So essentially, those are graphs that you put onto arteries when somebody has major blockages within their blood vessels in the heart. And so he was doing this cool research, and he just got me turned on to medicine, and I realized there, there was a blend between engineering and medicine. And it was kind of that intersection of technology and medicine that got me really excited. So I, um, you know, I worked with him, uh, did a summer research project with him, and then um, you know, finished, uh, graduated from engineering, I had to do some additional courses to, you know, be eligible to apply for medical school. So my biology, you know, some organic chemistry and so forth. And um, then, you know, uh, it's interesting. I was supposed to go back and do a master's in, with this fellow. And I worked internationally with a uh, group called Youth Challenge International. And they were doing some work with sort of the impoverished population in South America and I realized that, you know, hey, I wanted to travel for a bit. So I ended up working with them for like four months. And then I got a job with Doctors Without Borders. So I ended up, of all places, in Congo in Africa. Could you define and, for the listeners what Doctors Without Borders is so that, that, so that they are familiar with it? Yeah, absolutely. So Doctors Without Borders is an international NGO or non-governmental organization. Uh, they're pretty big. They were actually founded by... Um, I think it was eight physicians who kind of broke away from the International Committee of the Red Cross. And um, they were kind of, they had differing views than um, IARC because they really believed that doctors should both be providing medical care, but also be providing advocacy. And on the project they were working on, they were seeing, you know, essentially human atrocities taking place. And they felt that they needed to speak out about those. But IARC, or the International Committee for the Red Cross, had a policy of being completely neutral and not speaking out to international media. And so they founded Doctors Without Borders. So, so was it uh, the Doctors Without Borders and also the, the engineering project where you were working on cardiac stents that inspired you to go to medical school? Was that the, was that the uh, inspiration? I think so. I think it was like the ability to make a difference and then also that intersection with technology. Yeah. So when you went to medical school, did you say, 
I'm going to be a cardiologist or were you open to potentially pursuing other fields? I was definitely open. Um, you know, I tried a whole bunch of things in my uh, medical school. So I think that's really important to go in with an open mind. Um, I locumed with a, or sorry, I, I rotated with a chief of pediatric emergency medicine. I pretty quickly knew that children were not for me, <laughs> just maybe my personality. And also, you know, with pediatrics, you have to be good at both managing the child, but also the, the, the parents. And I think it was dealing with, you know, concerned parents that worried me more. Um, but, you know, I quickly found uh, cardiology and uh, I knew pretty much as soon as I rotated through that, that, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And when did you have the opportunity to do that? I was in my third year of medical school and uh, I rotated through their coronary care unit. So that's where the patients who are, you know, the most sick in cardiology go to. And, you know, I saw people having cardiac arrests and um, something called free wall rupture where you have a heart attack and then the heart bursts open. And then you had to, you know, do an emergency pericardiocentesis where you put a needle uh, with an ultrasound into the heart. So that kind of intensity was something that I really kind of really attracted me to cardiology. Um, and, you know, I felt that in cardiology, there's an opportunity to really kind of make that life or death decision. And so, yeah, so that, that's how I got turned on by it. What was it about that experience though? Was it, was it the intensity? Was it the fact that you were saving lives that you felt like you could really make an impact and a change in, in the quality of life for that individual? I think that was the biggest thing. I think it was, I always imagine being a doctor and, you know, say you're walking down a street and you see somebody collapse on the sidewalk and you think, hey, I can actually uh, intervene on this person. So that would be very different than, say, you know, being an eye doctor where, you know, you're pretty focused on one particular area and you may not have that skill set. So I think that was like my view of what a you know, a doctor I wanted to be would be. You know, for for a lot of medical students, and I would argue also for some residents, they're scared of reading EKGs or echoes because the, the EKGs, you know, they seem challenging. So what would you say to a medical student or even an intern or a resident in terms of, you know, how, how do you get them over that fear and kind of inspire them to, to, to still consider car, cardiology as an option? Because it seems like the EKGs are, are what turns a lot of people off. <laughs> no, it's really true. I mean, they can be pretty uh, scary. And I, I was I definitely felt that, you know, I was like, when am I ever going to learn this stuff? You know what I would say? I, I would say it's volume. So I worked I rotated with a cardiologist in my internal medicine year. And he exposed me just to a lot of ECGs. So every night he would read 100. He would put a stack in front of me and I would go through them all and I would write what my impression was and then he would review them. And it was through that seeing the volume that you really get good. It's, it's essentially like pattern recognition. So what would you say to a medical student? Do, do you think they have the time to actually devote to – uh, you know, analyzing those EKGs, or is that something they should wait till till they're doing an internal medicine rotation or uh, an internship or the residency to really start mastering the EKGs? I think I think it's a useful skill. I mean, it's not to say that you need to know everything about ECGs, but being able to identify the big things. So, you know, is this patient having a heart attack, like an acute STEMI? That would be important to know. So knowing kind of the, you know, the, the important stuff. And like the thing is like on the Internet now, there's so many great resources um, that it's pretty, pretty reasonable to pick up. So let me ask you a question. After that sure. third year rotation you had mm -hmm. and you said, you know what, I'm going to do cardiology. What did you do next? Did you make sure that in your fourth year you had rotations lined up? Yeah, so I wrote, I, um, well, that was my only cardiology rotation. But after that, I really focused on internal medicine, um, at least in Canada. And I, I'm pretty sure it's similar in the US. You need to have internal medicine before going into cardiology. So I just did a lot of internal medicine specialties. Um, I still rotated through like a couple of different specialties just to make sure that this is really what I wanted to do. Like I did GI and so forth. 
gastroenterology. Um, but yeah, internal medicine, you know, was kind of the bulk then of my electives. Okay, so fast forward, you apply for residency. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you have to do. Do you have to do internal medicine for three years before you can get into a cardiology fellowship? That's right. Internal medicine for three years and then um, basically in your third year of uh, residency, kind of in the early third year, you're applying for cardiology. So, and then you have a matching process. And did you know when you were doing your internal medicine uh, residency that you were indeed going to follow through with cardiology or were you still open to other options? No, I was – at that point, I knew, like, it was going to be cardiology. So I really focused through my internal medicine of picking up cardiology electives. Um, I think it's really useful to know early on if that's what you want to do because then you can build the relationships with people who are going to write those letters of reference for you. Um, if they know you in the program, uh, then it's really helpful. I did do some other electives. Like, I did an elective at Johns Hopkins – in internal medicine, um, I did some like I did an elective with uh, pretty well known, uh, as well as research actually John Webb, who basically pioneered the uh, TAVI or TAVR I think you call it in the U.S. Uh, so that's when you're putting the aortic valve through the blood vessel in the leg up to the heart. So I rotated th with those people, um, and research is a really good way to get in because. With research, you have a real opportunity to build a relationship with that person. Um, and it also shows that you're kind of keen above and beyond just your clinical stuff. You know, if you can actually follow through on a publication, that speaks a lot about, you know, your determination and your drive. And that's something that a lot of programs, particularly academic programs, want to see. And cardiology is very competitive to get into. So I'm assuming, you know, even starting research in medical schools is you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the leg up. Um, if someone's interested in pursuing cardiology, mm -hmm. are there certain internal medicine uh, residency programs one should pursue? I would say if you're in a top tier program, you're going to stand a much better chance of getting into other programs. But that's not always the case. I think if you have a strong rec, like if you're in a program, say, that isn't considered to be top tier, but you happen to do electives at top-tier programs, which you could certainly arrange, that's a great opportunity to make those connections. At least they get to see you in person. You know, like if you know you want to do cardiology at, I don't know, Brigham and, Brigham and Women's in Boston or Stanford, I think arranging an elective where you want to do your cardiology training makes a lot of sense. Now, what do you love about cardiology? I Like I said, I love the blend between technology and medicine. Um, right now, I'm currently working on a software platform. Um, and along the way, I always like had mentors that were sort of in that area. So I mentioned John Webb, who pioneered the transiotic valve implantation. Um, but there was another fellow, William Hunter, who essentially developed the drug-eluting stent and founded this company called An Angiotech. This was in Vancouver, BC. And that was the first stent to come out on the market, the drug looting stent. And Boston Scientific licensed that stent. So he was like an MD. He had a master's in science, and he kind of combined both. And he never actually ended up really practicing medicine in the end. Now he's CEO for another pharmaceutical company. But, uh, you know, it was really that kind of blend between the entrepreneurial spirit, that technology and medicine that I really loved. And I think that's something that cardiology really offers. It's got that it's got that intersection. And there's a lot of break there's a lot of breakthroughs right now, not only with the technology and the engineering, but also with medication. So it must be a very exciting time to be in cardiology because you can make an impact in people's lives in a way that you couldn't do twenty years ago. Huge. Cardiology's come so far like the TAVI, uh, you know, the aortic valve. Now they're starting to do mitral valve procedures. They're starting to do tricuspid valve procedures. All of these are non-invasive. Before you had to do, like, you know, the zipper, the sternotomy, you know, they'd have to spread the ribs. Now they're doing this all through blood vessels in the leg. It's pretty phenomenal. And, you know, 
patients who are like in their late 70s, early 80s, who otherwise wouldn't have been eligible for open heart surgery, now can be afforded these procedures. So it's pretty, pretty fantastic. Okay, so so take us, let's go back to residency, towards the end of residency, you're applying for fellowship. What is fellowship like? Is fellowship a year? Is it two years? Is it three years? What does it entail? How intensive is it? So fellowship in cardiology is generally three years. Um, although I believe in some programs in the U.S., you can fast track it to be two years. Um, the nice thing about fellowship is you have a lot of time to do the area you want to do. So there's a lot of subspecialties within cardiology. So there's electrophysiology, which is the electricity of the heart. Um, so if you, you know, if somebody's having an arrhythmia, they can undergo a procedure called ablation where they get that arrhythmia burned out. You know, they learn how to do pacemaker implantation or defibrillator implantation. So that's for somebody, if their heart's going to stop beating, you know, it will shock them internally back into a normal rhythm. Um, so that's electrophysiology. Then you can do interventional cardiology, which involves, you know, deploying stents in the coronary vessels, which are the blood vessels that lead to the heart. Um, or you can do what I talked about, structural interventional cardiology, which is deploying valves into, you know, the aortic mitral valve. So, um, and then there's other specialties like heart failure. So if somebody's had a big, you know, heart attack and their heart isn't pumping well, you know, there's like really cool advanced heart failure stuff you can do. I have a friend who, uh, he's currently a professor at Harvard at uh, Mass General, and he did, you know, three years of subspecialty beyond his cardiology <laughs> training. And he did, um, he did, you know, like LVADs, which are like ventricular assist devices that help people whose pump function isn't that great um, to kind of like make it through until they get heart transplantation. Um, and that heart transplantation is its own unique area. You know, there's cardiac imaging, which, you know, now they have MRI, they have CT, they have echocardiography. You can do like an advanced imaging fellowship. There's a lot of cardiology. options. There's a, there's, there's a plethora of, of different things that you can do in cardiology. And if you don't want to do I'm, surgery, because, yeah. you know, you don't want to be a cardiac surgeon necessarily, there are still other options out there for you to choose. Absolutely. Uh, now, how about the intensity of both the internal medicine residency as well as the fellowship? Are, do you have a lot of call? Um, is it is it strenuous? Is there still life? Light, um, um, is there a lifestyle balance essentially when you pra You know, when you're a resident fellow, or 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 are you really spending a lot of time in the hospital? I would say for the most part, internal medicine and cardiology in terms of call requirements are pretty heavy. Um, yeah, definitely. And if you choose, say, interventional cardiology, you're looking at call for the rest of your, of your life, right? Um, but once you get into kind of beyond cardiology fellowship, if you chose, say, electrophysiology, they rarely come in at nighttime. So it's a lot of just daytime procedures and that has a pretty decent lifestyle associated with it. And the cool thing is you're doing procedures as well. So not many specialties will afford that. So you kind of have to like take the upfront brunt of it, you know, work hard, internal medicine, cardiology uh, fellowship. And then, you know, there are some good lifestyle options beyond that. Okay. So you get out of fellowship and you have the option of, of what outpatient, inpatient, a mix of both. Uh, what, what are the what are the career options once you finish your fellowship? Um, you could do like purely outpatient. Um, I I would say, and my understanding is in the U.S., the majority of cardiology positions require a bit of interventional um, because hospitals tend to make a lot of their money um, through the interventional procedures. Um, so they usually want you to have a bit. But I have spoken with uh, recruiters down in the U.S. and they have you know ping me for general cardiology positions, which really don't involve too much call. Um, so yeah, there is like definitely a lot of options, right? Um, if you work, say, through the VA system in the US, uh, generally the hours are fixed, you're salaried, um, but generally you're kind of working nine to five for the most part. Um, so yeah, there are there is some flexibility in terms of how you can schedule your your career. Dr. Murphy, I'm going to ask you a tough question. 
Sure. Is there anything you do not like about cardiology? I would say the call was pretty hectic towards the end. You know, you're starting to get into, um, you know, starting a family and this kind of thing. And so then, you know, other things take priorities in your life. Um, I would say that would be a drawback for sure. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. So what would you say to a medical student who's just starting out? It's their first year or even their second year. Um, they're interested in cardiology. What would you do to inspire them? Yeah, and they want to go into I, cardiology, by the way. Okay. Um, I would try to find inspirational people within the field. You know, don't sell yourself short. Go for the big, big guns, you know. Try to line up fellowships with, you know, people who are top notch in their field. Those are the people you want to inspire you. You know, you don't want to be with some, um, well, I'm not putting other cardiologists down, but you definitely want to get working with somebody who's like, you know, they're totally passionate about the field. They've dedicated time in the field. They've made a difference. Those are the people that are going to inspire you to get into the specialty. Okay, so your biggest your biggest advice is find someone in cardiology who really loves what they're doing, who's doing cutting edge exactly. research, or is really doing innovative things with their patients, um, because those are the, those are the doctors that will inspire you to become cardiologists. I think so. Yeah. Okay, well, Dr. Murphy, this has been a super interesting interview. I really feel that you've inspired future cardiologists, and thank you again for all of your insight and the patience that you took to take us through the journey that you went through to become a cardiologist. Okay, thanks very much for the opportunity. I wish all, all of you the best. Thank you so much.